Rahman Rahim. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, ever merciful. Assalamu alaikum. Peace and blessings of Allah be upon you, dear viewers. Welcome to tonight's lecture organized by the UK Talim Department. As per our tradition, we will start with the recitation of the Holy Quran. Can I please request Rafi Ahmed Shanawas Sahib to recite a portion of the Holy Quran? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wa alaikum salam. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. <coughs> La Uqsimu bi yawmil qiyamah. Wala Uqsimu bin nafsil lawamah. أَيَحْسَبُ الْإِنسَانُ أَلَّنْ نَجْمَعَ إِزَامَهُ بَلَا قَادِرِينَ عَلَىٰ أَنْ نُسَبِّيَ بَنَانَهُ Surah Al-Qiyamah, verse 1 to 5, has been recited. Translation. I seek refuge with Allah from Satan, the accursed. In the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful, nay, I swear by the day of resurrection, nay, I swear by the self-accusing soul that the day of judgment is a certainty. Does man think that we shall not assemble his bones yeah, we have the power to restore his very fingertips. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammadin wa barik wa sallim inna ka hamidun wa jee. Jazakallah. Um, tonight we have the pleasure of being joined by Dr. Muhammad Iqbal Sahib. He's a retired healthcare manager who has worked for some of the biggest global pharmaceutical companies over the last 35 years. He has served as a non-executive director on a variety of NHS organizations in the Bedford district and is a member of the University of Bradford Council. He's producer and host of Living History programs on Voice of Islam and former president of the AMA of Bradford North. Dr. Iqbal has a deep interest in current affairs, history, and science and religion. Right. As always, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions. These will be put to Dr. Iqbal on your behalf in the last 15 minutes. Please type your questions into the live chat and kindly ensure they are relevant to the topic, today's topic. It gives me a great pleasure to hand over to Dr. Iqbal. Sir. Jazakallah, and um, thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present uh, once again. Uh, the subject that uh, we've chosen to speak on is Islam Ahmadiyat, the path to enlightenment. Um, enlightenment means a lot of things to a lot of people. Uh, firstly, it's something that's important to all peoples of the world, no matter which culture they come from. However, the Europeans, and we are part of the European continent now, um, have a special attachment to enlightenment, and they sometimes feel they own the word enlightenment. In uh, Western culture, um, after, of course, the great Muslim empire faded away, uh, there was a renaissance in uh, Europe. And um, following that, obviously, there was the Reformation and the Enlightenment. And quite often, um, the Europeans see Enlightenment as something special to their culture. Um, this discussion, however, is not going to look at the Eurocentric view of Enlightenment. Uh, it's going to be a much uh, broader. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with European uh, history, <laughs> 
And if you've uh, read some of the history books, you'll see what I mean by a Eurocentric view of world history and uh, development. Um, often, um, all civilizations are brushed aside very quickly as having developed in uh, the Near East or Asia and the Middle East. And then, of course, civilization got transferred um, to Europe through Crete. And then, of course, you had the great Greeks and the Romans who not only built great buildings, but produced some of the greatest philosophers and thinkers of the time. And in many ways, they say they were the enlightened people of uh, Europe. And then they describe the Dark Ages. For us, of course, during those Dark Ages, we had one of the most golden moments of human history with the rise of Islam and the great Islamic civilization. But sadly, the Europeans call that chapter the Dark Ages. And then, of course, as I said, you had the Renaissance um, starting from Italy and spreading across uh, Europe. You had the Reformation, Martin Luther in Germany, etc., with the religious reformation of Christianity. And then, of course, enlightenment uh, with some of the great thinkers, both from the world of science and uh, literature and art, etc. So this talk is not about European enlightenment. It's about a broader subject. Uh, um, true enlightenment, certainly in my view and in our views as Muslims and as Amdis, uh, comes from God Almighty. Um, many, of course, and I'll go through this later on, in the West do not believe in a God, but that's a separate matter. Um, up till, you know, 100 plus years ago, most of the Western world and the rest of the world believed in the God. And therefore, true enlightenment comes from the creator of the universe. And for us, uh, Muslims, one of the greatest events uh, happened around 610, the Christian uh, era, when a lonely Arab figure of our beloved Holy Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi was sitting in a, a cave, uh, thinking about uh, life, about God, about the universe. And God Almighty revealed himself through Angel Gabriel. And these are the wonderful verses that came first in that enlightenment of our beloved Prophet. And I'll just recite them because these are important in Surah al alaq chapter 96, verses 1 to 6. It says, recite, recite in the name of thy Lord who created, who created man from a clot, which is normally what translations are, but it can be translated into a clinging form, which is an embryo, because science is not developed. So I'll read again, who created man from a clot or an embryo, recite, thy Lord is the most generous, who taught by the pen, taught man what he knew not, in this very first revelation, God Almighty spelt out two important events and developments in humankind's development. First, the biological development of mankind. And again, in the talk, I'm going to go into that uh, later on. And then the social, cultural, more spiritual development, which God Almighty taught, starting from Adam, but taught by the pen of how mankind developed, etc. And the the scriptures from different religions are a witness to uh, how the pen was used to develop uh, mankind. So enlightenment really is important for every single one of us, um, no matter whether we are philosophers or we're a, a you know, village farmer in some remote part of the world. Questions come to our mind. Who am I? Where am I? How did I get here? Where did I come from? And what is my final destination? And there's a beautiful saying of the Holy Prophet which says, when any among you shall set his foot upon the road to knowledge, Allah shall set him upon the road to paradise. And of course, our ultimate aim is to find our paradise through our creator, our God. Now, most of us, especially in the Judeo-Christian or Abrahamic uh, uh, traditions, including Islam uh, as well, um, are taught about the central story uh, of Adam and Eve and uh, paradise. We are, in uh, a sense, all the children of Adam uh, and Eve. And that's a complicated story, which we'll go into. Uh, this is just taken from Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, but the Holy Quran, of course, deals with the subject of Adam and Eve uh, quite thoroughly. Um, 
generally speaking, you will all know, both in the Judeo-Christian tradition and in the Muslim tradition, the orthodox or general belief was that Adam and Eve grew up in some special heavenly place and then they were transferred to earth. There's lots of different interpretation about that. The Quran uh, it does not say it in that manner. So let's take the logical interpretation that wherever it was, Adam and Eve as the earliest people to receive enlightenment and guidance from God Almighty uh, grew up and developed in a heavenly place, wherever it was on earth. People, of course, have the right to believe if they want to in a he heavenly paradise, and there's so much literature that's full of it. Even in this age, even when you go to universities, you'll see many Muslims and Christians who, who genuinely believe that. So our earliest development is traced through our holy books, the Holy Quran and other scriptures as well of how mankind developed and profited came, etc. But I, uh, in this talk, want to take you on this journey. And part of the journey can be the journey of Adam and his children, whatever, but part of it is a personal journey. Because for me, I also lived in my own little paradise called Kashmir. Many of you know it's one of the most beautiful places on earth, um, surrounded by rivers and wonderful uh, scenery. And in many ways, to be honest, when I grew up, uh, we were farming people. We lived off the land. It's as though if we were living in the time of Adam, no, no link with the outside world in such a remote part of the world. So we do have our own little paradise that we live in. And one of the things that happened to me was I was transported, shipped off at the age of 9, 10 to the West. Now, you can imagine having lived a life as a child up to the age of um, you know, 9, 10, um, you could have said, uh, you know, I could have lived in the Sumerian plains or in the plains of Egypt or uh, uh, the Yellow River or wherever else. Uh, and then being put on this strange mechanical electronic plane and shipped off to the West. So it's been a traumatic uh, uh, journey. But I want to share something uh, special with you. Um, in my little paradise, in my place, um, I initially wasn't called Muhammad Iqbal. And that's why I put one of my great heroes' uh, quotes up there. What's my name? Uh, when I was born, like the rest of my brothers, I was given the name of Muhammad Shafi, because all my uh, Ghulam Shafi, sorry, because all my brothers were named Ghulam Nabi, Ghulam Rasul, Ghulam Rubani, Ghulam Murtaza, and of course I had to fit in there as well. And I had two sisters related to Fatma, name of I, Ghulam Fatma and Wazir Fatma. So anyway, um, I'm told that when I was very young, I used to be very ill all the time. And my father was a wonderful, wonderful father, as all our fathers are. Very spiritual, dedicated, illiterate. He was not an educated person. But he prayed to Allah and changed my name to Muhammad Iqbal. And that name has um, been very important for me, my development and how I look upon uh, life, uh, etc. So a name is very important, just as it was for Muhammad Ali, because... Uh, the Christian world refused to call him Muhammad Ali. They still call him Cassius Clay. And you will know how he responded uh, to all that. But one of the beautiful teachings of Muhammad Ali was about Islam and about life. And uh, you know some of the quotes, uh, this is a lovely quote from him. A man who views the world the same at 50 as he did at 20 has wasted 30 years of his life. Now, I'm 63 plus. <laughs> And uh, I want to uh, say, share this journey with you because in this journey you will see how people's attitudes, views to life and the whole concept of God, religion and everything around changes. And I want to be honest and open with you because my God has um, been kind to me in many ways. And one of my lucky features was that I, my eldest brother brought me up when I arrived in the UK. My parents were still in Kashmir, my mother and father. Uh, and that must have been traumatic for them to see a child go, as it was traumatic, probably more traumatic for me at the age of nine and ten, to be honest, to be put on a plane and shipped off to uh, the, the UK. Uh, in our village, we call UK Valayit, um, you know, the sort of foreign land. And um, I had never seen, uh, there were no roads in my village. I'd never seen a car. I'd never seen a light bulb. I'd never seen virtually anything in my village, even my language was so remote that I couldn't speak the Pahari, which we speak around uh, Kortli, Mirpur, etc. Never mind the Punjabi of Pakistan, India, etc. 
and didn't have a clue about Urdu or any other languages. So my local dialect was called Gojri, a uh, specific Kashmiri language. That's how, <laughs> that's how remote we were. But anyway, I was told that um, we were going to be shipped off to Balayat, a foreign land where the English lived, who were extremely powerful, they ruled the world, and um, they basically captured the rest of the world, enslaved much of the world, but they were great because they ruled the world. So that was it. And uh, basically, um, we were Muslims. Uh, in the village, I have to say, uh, Ahmadiyyat, uh, I, I'd been there with, in my family from the Promised Messiah, al Islam's uh, days. Um, but, you know, we all lived with the Sunni Shias, whatever, we lived very closely. Nobody really uh, had any problems with anybody. And as far as I knew, I was just a Muslim. I didn't have enough understanding about Ahmadiyyat or what it was. And our village was so peaceful and nice, even up to the 1990s, we could do the Azan without any problem until Rabba told us to stop doing the Azan. So that's how nice it was up there in terms of people loving and caring for each other, regardless of our faith. So when I was shipped off, I was told we were going to go to England, mm -hmm. where people worshipped worship Isa, uh, our, our prophet, Isa al -Islam, but they considered him to be a god, etc. So I was going to a Christian land. I have put a quote in there from William Blake, who is uh, a fabulous, wonderful poet of um, Britain. And uh, I'll read his uh, poetry to you because uh, the English culture was based on Christian culture. But the English culture I came to in 1967 was very different to the Christian culture of 100 years ago, 300 years ago, to the time of William Blake, who wrote, Bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. That's a beautiful hymn and song, which is, sounds much nicer than my recitation. But anyway, you can see the words. Bring me my spear, O clouds unfold. Bring me my chariot of fire. I will not cease from mental strife, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand, till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. So you can see how dear Christianity and Christian culture was to him. But in all honesty, in 1967, when I landed in England, you couldn't see much Christianity around. Of course, my village hadn't told me about the Beatles and all the other uh, pop culture developments that were going on uh, uh, up there. But what I'm trying to say is I didn't exactly land in a typical Christian culture. It was a very different culture. Uh, really, the sort of... Uh, early days of the 60s revolution was uh, well, well uh, on its way. At the 60s revolution, you can write books and books on that, how it changed British society. So that's what I essentially uh, came to. Um, so again, when you arrive, uh, I, I'll share with you my first six weeks when I arrived, I virtually cried myself to sleep every night. I miss my parents, I miss my culture, I miss my little paradise. My brother was working at night to earn money to support us and back home, and he was a wonderful, wonderful figure. But he was not around when I was crying in those night time, and it was just me and my other brother was three years older than me. And um, that's how difficult it was. And all the time, these questions go, where am I? What am I doing here? Why? Etc. So these are really searching uh, questions. And... Before I go on to this slide, from the age of um, around 10, when I came, 9, 10, whatever it was, to the age of about, um, I don't know, it was 18, 19, I really had a very, very difficult time growing up. Um, firstly, as I say, I, even languages, I had to learn Pahari, I had to learn Punjabi, I had to learn a bit of Urdu, and then I had to learn a bit of English as well and understand uh, the world uh, around me. Um, and then there was a, a, a little bit about trying to understand how you fit in in a Western culture, which was totally, totally different to what you were used to. Um, most of the time, it was very sort of free thinking and liberal. And you'll know, you'll have seen the films and things of the 60s, uh, far away from uh, the, our cultured uh, Muslim uh, culture that we were brought up in. And all the time, religion was under attack, traditions were under attack, in particular, Muslims were uh, under attack, Islam was under attack. And um, for us young Pakistanis growing up, to be honest with you, one thing we shared in common is we hated the mullahs. We didn't like Mulvis. 
So you grow up disliking Maulvis. You grow up in a culture which says you also your religion is backward. You grow up in a culture which attacks religion generally. It says be free, be open, enjoy life, you know, drink, socialize, etc. Everything. So you have a real problem. And just as uh, William Blake was having an identity crisis, because that was not the England uh, he, he could see and I could see. Uh, I, and I'm sure many others, went through a, a, a serious uh, identity crisis, and you do. And one of the things that's so fortunate, uh, certainly it was for me, and I think for most of us, was the prayers of our parents. I honestly do not know how I could have been saved in that environment if it wasn't for the prayers of my parents, and however God choose, chose to treat us with the kindness, because we were lost, we were confused. Yes, of course, there was a tiny Ambia community in Bradford with a few households, etc. And my brother, as I say, was one of the most loving figures who passed away two years ago. In many ways, I want to dedicate this talk to him, because he was a father figure, a friend, and a wonderful, wonderful human being. But it was difficult. He couldn't answer all my questions and queries, neither did anybody else, because there were no established mosques. Yes, we prayed in a few houses every so often at Juma. But, you know, with all the attacks against your religion, your culture and everything, it really was uh, difficult. And I don't know how um, uh, it happened, but I got uh, lucky. 1979 was a very transformative year for me. So I came in 67. And uh, my brother, by the way, had made me do some speeches forcefully <laughs> at the Ambia events that we had, uh, a few of them. And often I focused on very logical things, not the traditional speeches that you would make. But I didn't really know the difference between Ambies and anybody else and uh, the religions, etc. Um, so I, I'd lost a lot of my faith, if I'm honest with you, my religion uh, under so much uh, pressure. But 1979 was, as I say, a transformative period because we held a big Istama in Bradford and we were absolutely, you know, uh, uh, I can't describe the euphoria when we heard that Sir Zafrullah Khan was going to be the chief guest and coming. And that was the first Istama where I heard somebody charismatic, knowledgeable, amazing, talking about religion different cultures, the world, oh, it was absolutely, I mean, it was earth shattering for me, to be honest. Uh, it was just such a wonderful thing to be able to uh, see. And that really awakened something in me. Now, of course, by 1974, the Ahmadis had been declared uh, non-Muslim back home. And it hurt, and it, and it made me hate the mullahs even more. But I didn't really know enough of why that had happened. Um, but Jodhi Sahib, when he explained what Ahmadiyyat was, what true Islam was, what his role was, how he had contributed to the world, and other speakers also, it really um, sort of gave a spark in my mind. And then, because my brother was such a kind person who wouldn't force things on me, he used to lay <laughs> the review of religions and the Muslim Herald and a few other things. And one day, I picked up... Uh, um, a book called uh, Freedom of Faith and Conscience, and that's the central quote in there. You will know, see um, um, the third uh, a little booklet on freedom of faith and conscience. And that really changed my world because for the first time in that booklet, I read that you are not uh, hell bound and you're not forced to accept religion, that there was no compulsion in religion in Islam. Right is distinct from wrong. You have the choice, and you know you should love Allah, the All Hearing, All Knowing, and um, you know be a seeker of truth, etc. That booklet will really open my mind, and I thank my brother in my heart. And I started researching a, a little bit more. And around the same time, of course, my brother had nicely placed the book Philosophy of the Teachings of Islam, and um, the Philosophy of Teachings of Islam. Well, what can I say? Um, at that stage, I had got my admission into Nottingham to do biology degree. Um, I was living by myself, asking some very important questions. Uh, and believe it or not, at that stage, arranged marriage or forced marriage had been enforced upon me. And I was a little rebellious, but uh, you, you know, our generation never hurt the feelings of our parents. We just accept it. But those are things that you don't do. <laughs> I give that uh, as a warning and as a word of loving 
advice to your parents uh, and others. But anyway, it's a long story. Kashmiri culture is complex. Um, and um, I started reading a little bit more. Um, uh, and the philosophy of teaching is put everything in a nutshell for me about what true Islam was and the different states of man, the different stages of development from a physical animal almost being to a moral being of asking the questions about right and wrong and developing and then a spiritual being who gets raised obviously enlightened to be ultimately a reflection of God and the attributes of God Almighty. And so the book was just absolutely amazing in how it opened my mind and I read it so many times and I certainly recommend to everyone else that uh, that's uh, um, what, what they do with this book. But at the same time, um, you know, when I was going through schooling, my teachers also were very anti-religious, all the close ones. Um, and I read a lot of books on sciences. Science was my true love. That's what I wanted to do. And of course, I grew up knowing the sort of Darwinian view of evolution. And I grew up with the heroes of cosmology like Carl Sagan, etc. Uh, and then... Um, I did not know the, the really the criticism of uh, evolution at that stage. All I knew is that it's a fact. Everybody accepts it. And uh, uh, these poor religious guys, they, they, they've got it all wrong. But thankfully, the philosophy of teaching of Islam put it in perspective. So the flame had been, uh, the spark was there. The flame had been lit. And I you know, started understanding Islam and religion from a different point of view. And I also started reading a lot more. Um, about uh, religion and Islam and Ahmadiyya in particular. This just really sums up my early summary of what I found and uh, um, really um, that how God Almighty had created the universe so we don't have to reject God whether you believe in the Big Bang, etc., etc. I'll come to later on. But the, the booklet, Freedom of Faith and Conscience, uh, Azud had beautifully laid out how God has created the universe with the angels who have no choice and follow the commands of Allah and man who has been given a freedom to choose and how angels play a part. And again, I had this notion and view, traditional orthodoxy had angels and the Christian view also was angels were these, uh, you know, winged creatures running up and down, some causing havoc and some doing good things, etc. But uh, Azur explained that, you know, angels are much more than that. They include God's, you know, um, creation that control nature from the winds to the way the earth is formed to the way the human body is shaped, the whole universe, how it's been shaped. So it was a wonderful explanation. Uh, and you could see the linkage between science and religion being made uh, as well. So this, I'll come back to these diagrams later on because it's about some. And also, um, I read plenty of books which showed that uh, Islam was a beautiful religion and totally misrepresented by the media and sadly misrepresented by many Muslims as well. And many Western authors wrote beautifully about Islam as well, but also about the Islamic civilization. Uh, I was brought up with Tarzan and al Cid, you know, uh, uh, defeating those nasty Muslims and all the other Hollywood movies and stuff. And here I was reading, you know, from books of people like Robert Bethal, who, and I'm going to read this quote because it's important for youngsters if they're listening. In. And it says, the Greeks systematized, generalized, and theorized, but the patient ways of investigation, the accumulation of positive knowledge, the minute methods of science, detailed and prolonged observation, and experiment inquiry were altogether alien to the Greek temperament. What we call science arose in Europe as a result of a new spirit of inquiry, of new methods of investigation, of method of experiment and of the development of mathematics in a form unknown to the Greeks. That spirit and those methods were introduced into the European world by the Arabs. Modern science is the most momentous contribution of the Islamic civilization. Quotes and readings like that were just mind-blowing and really you know, opened up a whole new world for me to start reading as I, I went to university and then I understood that and uh, the European Enlightenment was an amazing thing, but maybe it came late for them compared to our civilization and many other civilizations. So I didn't buy the story. And of course, uh, apart from readings, the, the books of the Brahms, Messiah, and Madhya, Khulfa, uh, I had uh, the great fortune of meeting as a Chodhisar during my university days several times. 
And he was absolutely wonderful. I still feel those hugs of his when he used to say goodbye to me and how he guided me in a number of different areas. But of course, I had another great um, you know, uh, hero, uh, a role model for me in Professor Abdul Salam. Uh, Einstein, in honesty, has always been there. I mean, obviously, I knew about Professor Salam much later on, and Einstein was there. So for me, you know, they go hand in hand. And I know Professor Abdul Salam had great respect for Einstein. And, um, and Einstein genuinely believed that science and religion were two ways of trying to understand the whole world. It, it wasn't like the Dawkins and the Hawkins and other scientists of the current day and age who reject religion, which uh, is naive in my view, but that's a separate story. And then, um, of course, trying to understand the, the cosmos. Uh, you know, this is a quote from uh, Carl Sagan. And those of you who didn't see his program about the cosmos and the universe, you missed something. Uh, you know, 80s, 70s and 80s, etc. It was just absolutely amazing, but you'll have seen enough pictures of the cosmos. And then, of course, really, you go to the source of enlightenment, of wisdom for Muslims in particular in the Holy Quran. And just look at this beautiful verse, chapter 31, verse 22. And what is said to them, follow that which God or Allah has revealed. They say, nay, we shall follow that which we found our fathers following. This is certainly the view of much of the Christian world, based largely on their arrogance and at times ignorance. But this was the same view that was presented to us with Ibrahim alayhi salam by the great powers of that time, from um, the Sumerians to the Akkadians to the Babylonians to the Assyrians, the great rulers of the world. Um, and you know, he was a, he was a Semite prophet. Uh, um, not uh, much power apart from the love of God and the closeness to God. But uh, again, as the Ibrahim al-Islam used to ridicule their uh, silly beliefs uh, about all these gods, etc. So you can see God has used logic, even from the earliest time, to say, look, follow what God Almighty teaches you, etc. Then, of course, in chapter 7 and verse 43, the second verse, uh, their quotation, As to those who believe and do good works, and we task not any soul beyond its capacity, these are the inmates of heaven. They shall abide therein. So you can see the promise by God Almighty of elevating the human beings who choose to believe. And then this wonderful saying of the Holy Prophet, when in any among you shall set his foot upon the road to knowledge, Allah shall set him upon the road to paradise. So I don't need to explain that further. One of the great things about Ahmadiyyat, and so my title is Islam Ahmadiyyat, because um, Ahmadiyyat is Islam, and the renaissance of Islam is Ahmadiyyat. So, um, is the need for the followers of Amadi to understand how all the different religions are linked together. So um, this was a, a crucial bit of my research. And believe me, I read a lot of books. When I was doing my degree and PhD. Um, I read more books on religion and society than I did about my research papers. Uh, and thank God for that. And that's how God guides, as I said to you, holds your hand when you choose to say, please help me. Uh, help me to walk, help me to stand up. And um, this is a beautiful verse from uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, verse 286. This messenger, that's the Holy Prophet, believes in that which was revealed to him from his Lord and so to the believers. All of them believe in Allah and in his angels and in his books and in his messengers saying, we make no distinction between any of his messengers. And they say, we have heard and we are obedient. And again, um, chapter 40, verse 79, uh, Allah says, We indeed send messengers before thee. Of them are some who we have mentioned to thee, and of them are some we have not mentioned to thee. Uh, and again, chapter 16, verse 37, Verily, we have sent prophets to every nation with the message, Worship God, and do not listen to the wicked and the rebellious. And some of them, believed by the grace of God, and others remained in their error. So travel around the world, and you will find that God has sent his prophets to all nations, and you will learn the end of those who have rejected the prophets. And of course, when we pray in our Salat, uh, we ask Allah for the, uh, the guidance throughout. And when you look at just the commentary of Surah Fatiha by the Promised Messiah, Mehdi alayhi salam, 
you'll understand why he was a prophet of Allah, why he wasn't an ordinary great Muslim, who, who of course, he had been accepted as a great scholar of Islam, a great by virtually everybody uh, in the Muslim world up to the stage when he said, I am, God has told me that I am the promised Messiah and Nabi al-Islam. That's how God guides, God chooses who to appoint and when that person makes the claim of prophethood. Uh, you know, just reading Surah Fatiha is just absolutely amazing. And then all the books, 80 plus books that he wrote, and then the beautiful and wonderful writings of our Khulafa. There is so much knowledge, so much wealth. And just imagine, uh, Muhammad Muhammad was in a remote village in Qadian in the Punjab where no one uh, hardly knew of the place. And now look at Ahmadiyyad, how it is spread. And so, as I said, Ahmadiyyat is the renaissance of Islam, and Islam Ahmadiyyat is the path to uh, enlightenment. So I'm going to um, now just share with you a few slides based on a lot of my reading, a lot of my research to put things in perspective, because enlightenment is um, a very personal thing. Uh, every one of us has their own destination and God Almighty um, chooses uh, whoever he wants to elevate to whichever stage level, etc. And uh, the important thing is that we are honest in our search, we are honest in our prayers, and we read the books with honesty and open hearts and minds, and throughout ask for guidance for Allah Almighty. And I had so many instances where I felt God was with me, God was guiding me, whether it was some book that I came across. Whether, you know, God saved me driving a car at 90 miles per hour where I wrote it off on the M62 and I didn't have a mark on me. Whether it was just the way Allah helped me in my education. And, um, you know, as I say, I, I came from a very, very remote part of Kashmir. I loved my parents and my area daily. And to this day, I've done my best to keep the link with that remote village and help them with their development to keep the love of my family. And to move forward in my world, I can assure you, I've read a lot and uh, I've uh, I, I've tried to share what I've read with you through presentations, through MTA, through Voice of Islam, now the Living History Program, etc. And it is Allah's blessing and guidance. Uh, that's all I can say. Uh, and I hope and pray that Allah will continue to guide me. Uh, in understanding um, God Almighty and the world around us. So let me just go through this diagram. Pretty clear that we are all the children of Adam. And uh, by the way, there are many Adams as well. <laughs> That's a, a story for another time and a discussion for another time. But our cousin Adam cycle of 6,000 years ago, so Adam came somewhere in the Middle East. Uh, the journey of humanity and Homo sapiens, as you know, is over 150, nearly 200,000 years ago when we all came out of Africa. Um, the first place of worship, of course, was in um, uh, Arabia. And Africa and Arabia, by the way, were linked together, land bridges, etc., very early on. And as humankind developed and settled and learned to uh, things from God Almighty and prophethood came from Adam uh, all the way to Holy Prophet, uh, we have learned a lot. So from Adam, whether we read the Holy Quran or the biblical um, uh, versions, uh, we come down to Prophet Noah and the flood and remaking of uh, much of uh, sort of uh, uh, human thinking uh, of how God works and how God destroys those who are disobedient, etc. We have, of course, got the religious books and now from um, archaeology uh, uh, knowledge about the previous civilizations that existed as well. Uh, and you'll know in the Living History programs, I've done a lot of that as well. So please do visit uh, the Works of Islam uh, Living History section as well to, to, to know more. And then so much the Holy Quran in particular talks about regional prophets linking all the world together and bringing them under common uh, humanity uh, as well. Uh, and then the bottom bit is going down to um, uh, Prophet Abraham, lots of prophets as you know. Um, and then uh, looking at the Abrahamic traditions, the Judeo-Christian tradition, Islamic traditions, and uh, um, really the blessings we've received from uh, the uh, Isaac al-Islam, uh, the Ismail uh, al-Islam, 
uh, up to Jesus and the Holy Prophet Sallallahu um, So much could be written and said about them. I've probably got about five minutes before question time, so I will um, uh, rush through reasonably quickly. Uh, and again, the Holy Quran um, gives us so much about how God has sent prophets throughout the world. Uh, at one stage, we were united, but then, of course, they dispersed through geographical boundaries. They needed different teachings and uh, different concepts that were important to them, but they all were linked to God Almighty and revelations through the angels, uh, Gabriel Salam. So these are some of the different uh, prophets and the impact they've had on humanity and the books they've left behind as well. And that's something that I intend to cover in um, um, our history programs uh, uh, as well, living uh, history. So please do listen to those programs and uh, you'll um, hear quite quite a lot. And this is uh, a, a diagram. Uh, when I was doing my PhD, I was doing lots of different uh, things in diagram. I spent more time on philosophy, religion, and history than my sciences, to be honest. But uh, uh, science was my first love, but history and religion, I was, or the, the, it's a trinity of love. Um, and uh, this diagram, I think, quite nicely sums up uh, how God Almighty reveals uh, to mankind through the Gabriel. Uh, and man has been taken through social, cultural, moral, and spiritual development. Um, and there are those messages that remain original as they are, and they're represented in a practical way. By, but others get modified and they change, and therefore that's why you see the differences uh, in Judaism, Christianity, Taoism, Confucianism, um, Hinduism, etc., etc. And ultimately, um, the aim of religion was to help mankind become the image of God through all the great attributes, etc., which the philosophy of teaching of Islam uh, take us through. Uh, I love diagrams being a scientist, so I thought I'd share this uh, with you. Uh, and really, I want to end with uh, this one. Um, this really tells you how our journey to paradise uh, uh, develops. Um, God Almighty, you know, created the universe, and we told it's about 13 to 13 and a half billion years ago, and the, the age of the universe. Uh, and the Holy Quran is full of verses about the physical uh, evolution. Uh, mankind has been evolved from different stages, everything being created out of water. Um, you can see the embryological development now through science, how it shows from the two uh, cells meeting together, how mankind is finally formed. And then, of course, through religion, philosophy, the social, spiritual evolution of mankind, through Adam, the first prophet of so that is brings me up to about quarter two, um, and I want to now open up to some questions. Right, is that going to bring about that? Were you sharing your uh, journey setting in the UK and how it unfolded for your spiritual aspects? I'm pretty sure that your your personal accounts will benefit our viewers and provide the opportunity for them to reflect and enlighten them to follow the righteous path. Um, now I'll hand over to um, Bakar M. Desai, and uh, he will conduct the any questions so from our viewers. Uh, Dr. Sir, we have a couple of questions. Uh, one is from Malik Faraz Ahmed. Firstly, he expresses his appreciation for, mashallah, a very illuminating lecture, as has been mentioned. Um, he asks, uh, to what extent would you say that your knowledge and expertise in science has enabled you to understand the teachings of Islam better? Oh, it's been central uh, to me, if I'm absolutely honest with you. Uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, I came to this country without uh, my parents. I grew up with a very loving brother who tried to keep me grounded in religion and community uh, and Islam. But the pressures of this society are uh, enormous. Um, and especially early on, you know, Muslim culture was seen in very bad light. Um, and my uh, route back to Islam, Ahmadiyya, to be honest, was through the sciences. When I started reading in uh, <coughs> detail uh, all the things uh, and the philosophy of the teachings of Islam and the Prophet Messiah and Mary Al-Islam's book, it led me uh, um, uh, back to religion and Ahmadiyya and uh, 
uh, Islam. So um, yeah, it's it's a it's a journey, but uh, science was my first love always, and uh, now history is uh, my second love. <laughs> Uh, the second question is uh, perhaps suited to your background and expertise again is quite a philosophical question. Uh, the question is, if everyone has their own view of the world, how do you know which is the right one? I think uh, one of the good things about the Western world is um, uh, it is expanded on the scientific uh, method and the use of logic, etc. So that's very, very important. Um, but from an Islamic point of view, um, yeah, and again, Islam pays a, a lot of emphasis on using logic, on asking, searching questions, looking for the answer. But ultimately, you will know the truth when you put your hand in the fire, which is what the philosophy of teaching of Islam says. And that was my own experience of life as well. I have questioned almost everything. I don't know if that's a sin, <laughs> but I and and I have found by the grace of Allah, Allah has held my hands at times. And maybe because I grew up without my parents, He showed kindness to me. I was a, a lonely figure at nine, ten. Uh, and I, as I said to you, you know, my my journey is a bit like Adam's journey, if I'm honest with you. You know, I lived uh, a farming life in Kashmir, which is not different to six thousand years ago, or four thousand, five thousand years ago. I was thrown into uh, the Western world, you know, heading up to the moon, etc. Um, and it is only through um, God's love that God holds your hand when you say, uh, and that's the prayer that the Holy Prophet has taught us, that you say to God, help me, guide me. Um, but, uh, you, uh, but the Holy Quran says, use logic up to a point and searching and then put trust in Allah and Allah will guide you. But don't have blind faith because anybody can have blind faith. And to this day, this is why there are so many different religions. So another question. Um, what advice would you give to students who are struggling to balance their religious learning and secular? And you refer to your own challenges of, about that with your own background also. But if you're going to give any pieces of advice to those who are trying to balance between the two, how can they strike that balance? I think for your, uh, young Ahmadis in particular, it is much easier. Uh, when we were growing up from 67 onwards, the Jamaat was not really that organized. And I said, it, I was lucky I had a loving brother. Uh, I was lucky that I came across the, that, that booklet on freedom of faith and conscience and the philosophy of teachings of Islam. But nowadays, you know, Hazur is on the TV. There are so many books. There are so many masjids. There are so many centers. And there, there are so many auxiliary organizations of the Jamaat. So that link is much, much stronger than my days. But, you know, ultimately, it's about each individual turning to God. Because that's what the Promised Messiah, Mehdi Salam, taught us. That there's a living God. And each one of you needs to have a personal relationship. Um, and as I say, for me, it was a lot more complicated because I came from one of the most remote parts of Kashmir in the world. And by the grace of Allah, God has given me so much that I honestly... <clears throat> it's difficult sometimes to thank Allah enough. <clears throat> but, but each one of us has to turn to God and say, God, I need your help. Guide me. And, guide, and that's what the Promised Messiah actually taught us. Uh, and he will fulfill your uh, needs. Whatever questions you have, each one of us will have a different question, and God will fulfill that. But we've got so much literature, MTA, Jamaat organizations, everything. Inshallah, they say the future is bright for Ahmadiyya. Of course. Zakhala. Amir, Dr. Saab, if you're able to ask, answer another couple of questions, if you're able to. Uh, I think, yeah. again, it ties in with your own experience uh, growing up, especially in the UK also. Um, it's a question from Muhammad Nadeem Sahib, uh, who asks, how are we able to encourage our children to read various books to increase their knowledge? I'm not too sure if it's specific to religion, but uh, perhaps you can share your own experiences of that also. You know, it's so important that we read, and this is one of my worries that I have. And that a lot of our children, they do fantastic work, humanitarian work, organizational work, etc. 
but they must read some of the books. There's so much wealth, so much knowledge, wisdom in the books of uh, Amadeus, and of course other writers as well. Um, uh, but they must pick up some books. And I was lucky. I had such a loving and caring brother. He probably deliberately used to put the booklets on the table or something when I came back from the school or university or whatever, so that I would pick it up. But uh, we have to guide our children with love, but they must uh, read. And we're lucky now. You don't have to read. You can listen to Azur, um, you know, on the internet, etc. But reading is, uh, you know, uh, when, when the when God Almighty revealed to the Holy Prophet وسلم, some write, recite, some say, read. Just think about it. Allah wants us to be able to reflect and read and understand from the Holy Book and then also have that communion with God Almighty directly as well because our God is a living God. That's what the Promised Messiah and Mary Islam has taught us. But you must read the book, the Holy Book first and all the other books that explain from the Promised Messiah and the Khulfa uh, as well. So I would urge our youngsters that please, 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 you're doing some wonderful humanitarian work, but make sure you read the books that answer the deep questions. Zakullah. Um, I'll pair these two other questions that we've just re uh, received. Uh, one is from uh, Tony and the other one from Abdul uh, Hay. These are both from Facebook. Uh, one question is, how can we start uh, our conversation or dialogue with people who do not believe in God? Uh, and the second question is, how do you define faith in terms of living in the West? Um, in terms of dealing with the God, I think realistically in the Western world, the most important way of having uh, a detailed conversation is starting from your example. You could uh, say to people, you know, you need to understand religion, you need to understand God, but they've been lectured about these things for so long that they've almost become anti they run from religion because a lot of religions sadly do not provide the logical answers that uh, a searching person is looking for. And some of the religious people have been really quite damaging in their approach to people as well. So as Amadis, our example becomes important. And once your friends or other people see your example and then you talk about religion, I found they open up a lot more. So that person example is important and it's how you come across to them. You have to talk sensibly, logically, but that's what Amadeet by the grace of Allah provides you. There is so much knowledge and wisdom, but it's also about being a caring person as well so that they see you as a caring person because if religion doesn't teach you to be a caring person, it's meaningless. So that's important. Another bit was about, um, so, so, sorry, Wakara, Wakara, faith. How do you define how do you define faith in terms of living in the West? So faith faith is uh, important in a sense that uh, um, it really is the reflection of you as the character as the personality. Um, so you could uh, talk the hind leg off somebody and present this argument, that argument, etc. In the Western world, got plenty of people who are very good at talking, but if you can't uh, say walk the talk then eventually people see through you and they go. So Amadis are, I think, unique and should be unique in that they walk the talk and they, should, they can present the logical arguments, the philosophical arguments, the historical arguments, the political arguments, and the spiritual arguments, but also by their example they set, that's when you draw people in. So faith has to be really the the, the, the dress around you and people can see through that. And, Beauty of that dress and how you attract people. Okay, and uh, one final question I think this will be Dr. Sahib. Um, how do you think that the community, the Jamaat, helped you and can also help others as they go through their studies? Uh, it's, uh, it's a beautiful, it's a wonderful community. You know, I remember um, when I was growing up, as I said, I was quite confused, quite lost, and uh, when Cleomancy Salis Remullah came to the Midland Hotel in Bradford, my brother said, oh, you must come and go. And I used to have really long hair. <laughs> we all did in the 70s. And also, I was a little rebellious and um, not a, a traditionalist. So I said, no, no, I'm not going. They'll tell me off if I go, etc. And he might pick on me. And he said, no, 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 of course you are. And when I went and I just saw his loving character, that lovely white beard and the smile, it just melted my heart. And then after that, really, uh, I was so fortunate, uh, the sort of people I came across, 
um, and the, the, the meetings with uh, the Zafrullah Khan Saab in uh, London. Um, and then the Ijtimaas, uh, because I really started attending the Ijtimaas uh, during my university days. And coming across people like Dr. Zaid Khan and uh, his, his brother Ilyas and Sir Shidemdi and so many of others over time, you get that bond of community um, and love. And, uh, you know, we played sports, but we thought in depth about life and what it meant. So the Amdi community is a wonderful way of hopefully reigniting the love and uh, trust uh, um, in, in God and shaping the world uh, in the way the Holy Prophet ﷺ wanted us to shape it and the Prophet Messiah and Mahdi ﷺ wanted us to do. Doctor, we've had a, a flurry of questions in the last part of the evening, Doctor. So maybe you can fit in one more question before we bring yeah. the session to a close with your permission. Um, Abdul Khan uh, asks, which uh, religious books would you advise that children read? Uh, maybe start religious books. Uh, the religious knowledge book, uh, which is basic to every uh, there, there's the small one with the, the question answer session. That, uh, I think we had a fix up uh, did uh, that was really nice in the young days, but now we have the thicker one with the, all the prayers and everything in them. And they're ideal from uh, you know uh, learning and uh, teaching uh, point of view. Uh, but then yeah, you know there's so much now on the internet as well. We've got so many options. It's just finding the right time and getting the kids to sit down and watching MTA together as well. That is so, so important. Um, of course, they can't watch long uh, you know, sessions of it, but you must uh, uh, watch certain sessions. And then on the Internet, you can pick the topic and find the answers. That's the beauty of it. And we've got so many different. I mean, this this Talim UK setup you guys have done, it's absolutely wonderful, I think, in addition to learning as well. So there's a lot there. Each parent really have to take the responsibility of making sure they provide it. We have to listen. We have to protect our young people as well. I grew up with a, a series called Roots about the development of black people and when they were enslaved from Africa. And um, one of the characters, Miss Kizzy, who brought up a son, Alex Haley, wrote that book of, and said, you know, children are like butterflies. If you hold them too tightly, you kill them. But if you leave the hand open freely and they fly away, they get eaten by spiders and other things. Our job is to make sure our children grow up in a safe environment and then they can fly and spread the message of family at this time. Zakmullah, Dr. Saib, for your um, uh, very enlightening uh, talk this evening, uh, which we have learned so much from your uh, personal experiences and also uh, a great reminder of the, the beauty that the Jumaat Ahmadiyya is for all of us. Um, so Allah bless you for all your efforts. Uh, and just to reiterate, um, Dr. Saib, as you know, is uh, the producer and host of the Living History programs on uh, Voice, of Radio, uh, Voice of Islam radio station. Uh, I've put the link there uh, for you to look at and access in your own time. It's a fantastic, mashallah, set of uh, podcasts on a variety of uh, really interesting and fascinating topics. So I very much hope that viewers will take advantage of that uh, uh, fantastic and timeless resource. Uh, Jazakallah. Um, just to give you a heads up about the lectures coming up uh, next week, inshallah. Uh, so our Urdu lectures return next Monday, that's the 2nd of November, when we will have the honor of being joined by Murabiya Sussala, um, Fazlur Rahman Nasir Sahib, his topic will be etiquettes of attainment of knowledge in the light of the sayings of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that will be next Monday at 8 o'clock. And then on Tuesday, a week today, again at 8 o'clock, we'll have a lecture by Jonathan Butterworth Sahib on the topic of Islam and spirituality in the West. So please join us for both the lectures at the same time as 8 o'clock next week. And we'll now hand over to our respected and Shakil Sahib, and uh, most of all to you, Dr. Muhammad uh, Iqbal Sahib. Allah bless you for all his coming back and uh, giving us so much knowledge. Exactly. And of course, to our dear viewers, if I could uh, humbly request you, uh, Dr. Sahib, if you could lead us in silent prayer so we can bring exactly. the program to its conclusion.
آمین 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 جزاک اللہ ایوری بڑی السلام علیکم